What is up, wrestling fans? And for all of you in the ODPH Society, don't turn that dial because we've taken over once again because it's that time of the week for them boys from 607 Podcast to talk all things pro wrestling and call it right down the middle. That's right. It's, it's, it's ready for this edition of 607 TWS, the wrestling show. Of course, we are coming to you from the ODPH Dungeon, the realest thing in all of pro wrestling podcasting. Of course, I am your host here, and I'm also the host of the 3FM Podcast. My name is Rich, and in the co-pilot's chair as he is each and every week, but you know him better as the host of the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour Podcast, better known as the ODPH. I'm talking about Ken M. 607 Podcast family, what is going on? What is happening? What is good? Let's talk some pro wrestling, shall we? And of course, whenever we do these crossover events, that means the one and only co-host of the ODPH, the man, the myth, the legend, Padawan J is in the third chair. Yeah, uh, like big wrestling show this past weekend. You got to bring in a third member. Absolutely. There's always got to be a third member. Hit the NWO music and get the copyright infringement. Yes. Well, uh, there was a lot going on in the world of pro wrestling. We got a lot to dive into. Of course, we're going to be on both the 607 TWS Network of Podcasting and the ODPH this week. And uh, speaking of big weeks, next week, huge week for the ODPH because next oh, week yeah. is a lot of work for everybody in this room currently. So yes. it's, it's almost upon us. The NFL preview shows, uh, that is next week, Cor- correct, Ken M? Yes, it will be going on Tuesday and Wednesday night, respectively. Tuesday will be the AFC, Wednesday will be the NFC, so we're going to be bringing you all the NFL news you need to know going into the season kickoff next Thursday night. And, of course, uh, before we get there, let's talk about some pro wrestling. And before then, I'm going to turn it over to Padawan J to tell the fine folks how to find the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour podcast. ODPHpodcast.com. Perfect. Uh, exactly. What else can you say? If you want to talk blogs, you want to talk Patreon, you want to talk T Public, you want to talk the directory, you can find friends of the show such as the 3FN Podcast, Dragon Master Games, Nerd Initiative, and so many more. The music section, the classifieds. Basically, if it's anything and everything that is the ODPH, you can find it at odphpodcast.com. I'm going to keep it a little short and sweet this week. If you want to find all the social media links and all the links for the 3FN Podcast and find me, it's simple 3FNPodcast.com. We've got a big show, so I don't want it to go too far in there. Of course, patreon.com slash 3FN Podcast. Uh, little as $1 a month, you get a ton of extra bonus content that link is on there as well links to all the shows we do the direct band directory big shout outs to floodlands whose song ruins is our theme song each and every week here for 607 tws and also shout out to our good friend second suitor whose song one winged angel takes us home every week and if you're listening from the odph section yeah you might not know that but now you do so shout out to them check out the musical directory check out the sponsors of the show like dragon master games and so much more at 3fnpodcast.com we have a lot to talk about. Yes, it's we do. It's been a big week. Unfortunately, we have some bad news to start with uh, because before we even dive into talking about the wrestling show, uh, because obviously in the main event, we will be breaking down this week's payback pay-per-view from WWE. Uh, in the mid-card, there's some Game Changer Wrestling uh, shows coming up, as well as Pro Wrestling Revolver, and uh, MLW is back on pay-per-view mm-hmm. on Fight TV. And uh, but in the opening contest, we'll be talking all elite wrestling, of course, the biggest wrestling event ever. Uh, wasn't that the tagline or something like that for Asterix. All In? Yes. All In, yes. And uh, the All In Fallout, we will be giving you our full review and everything else. But before we can do that, unfortunately, we had bad news this past week. Uh, we'll start off with <laughs> Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, unfortunately, on Wednesday, we had learned that uh, Terry Funk, the legendary Terry Funk, had passed away at the age of 79. Uh, t- you know, Terry has been going through some rough times lately. Uh, there was a point in juncture where everybody thought that he was going to be gone, but previous to this, and he kicked out at two, and unfortunately, he did not kick out at two this time. Uh, so, you know, uh, I, I, uh, it hit me a little hard. I had the privilege and pleasure of working with Terry Funk on a few different occasions. Uh, my first time, I'm going to give a little story. My first time I met Terry Funk, and this is probably one of the most marked stories I could ever tell about myself, and I don't care, and I've, I've worn it proudly. Uh, I met Terry Funk at a 2CW show. At the time, I was just kind of doing like handler duties and stuff like that. It was before I actually was like an agent or booker or any of that happy jazz. And uh, Terry Funk was coming in, and it was the first time he came in for us, and we came in for us a few times. And that's how I got to work with him. But uh, Terry Funk came in, and he was doing uh, pictures. And I was like, back then, you know, and now I always tell people take the pictures. I, I wish we'd, I, we took the pictures with everybody. But back then, even, you know, we, you know, don't take the pictures, don't be a mark. But I didn't care because I was going to get a picture with Funk Terry Funk. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's Terry Funk. And so I asked, I went down before the crowd came in. I took a picture with him. I said, hey, Mr. Funk, can I get a picture? And he said, uh, what's your name, son? And I said, my name is Rich. 
And he goes, well, my name is Terry. We're friends now. Just call me Terry. And out loud, audibly, I said, I'm friends with Terry Funk. <laughs> uh, so, and I, I took a picture of him. So uh, it, it's just sad. He was a super nice guy. One of only two people I've ever seen that went in. He's very soft spoken. That's why when I did the voice, he's very soft spoken. But one of the only two people I've ever seen in the wrestling business who, when they talked, the entire locker room was quiet and, and would listen to him, uh, him and Steve Carino pretty much. And uh, just terrible loss. He was one of the guys that there's the reason why we have wrestling now is because guys like him who uh, took the younger kids under their wing and, uh, you know, showed him the ropes, but the living legend is going to be sorely missed. Uh, he is literally, when you look at the definition of legend, a legend. So rest easy friend, uh, you know, to every, all the family, friends and fans of Terry Funk, you know, we definitely are with you in this sad time, mm-hmm. but then we got kicked to the balls a little more because the very next day, which would have been Thursday this past week, we learned that, uh, Wyndham Rotunda, better known to most people as Bray Wyatt, uh, had passed away at the age of 36 from presu- uh, presumably cardiac arrest. Uh, I think that's pretty much gone around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the I'm, details are out there. Read them at your own risk. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, there's some sadness to that story as well. Of course, 36 years old, very young man. Uh, just too bad we didn't get to see him hit the real prime of his career. Did so many great things. Uh, I know that you gentlemen would like to talk about Bray Wyatt. So go ahead, Pad. Yeah, no, I uh, got to see Bray in in here in uh, 607 Binghamton at least once, maybe twice. Mm-hmm. You know, I think the one time I remember was I. it was right after one of the pay-per-views. I forget which one. And it was already announced who was going to be facing who. And it was announced that, you know, the main event was going to be then Dean Ambrose, now John Moxley taking on Bray Wyatt. And, we're, and I remember, Ken, you and I were sitting there going, why? why is this a thing? And then the pay-per-view happened and Bray interfered with, with uh, Moxley's match. We're like, oh, that's why. You know, so we got to see him here when the whole Fireflies here uh, in person, which was awesome to see. You know, definitely one of the better, you know, creative minds of his generation. You know, just everything he got to do and just how creative it was and how it, it never seemed to, like, settle into one place. That it just kind of kept spinning and growing and expanding, you know. And, and it's a shame that we're not going to get to see it play out because I know a lot of people were kind of, you know, mixed on how long it was taking with what his last gimmick was. I was all in for it. I was enthralled with where it went. So I'm, I'm disappointed we're not going to get to see that play out to its conclusion. But for what we did get to see, it, it it was incredible and astounding to watch. He will be sorely missed. No, absolutely. I mean, I think you, you we see him growing up through NXT and obviously knowing his his family has been all in the wrestling business as well, too. And to see how he bursted on the scene and really took a gimmick and ran with it. And you talk about grabbing the brass rail, as it's always talked about. He's a guy that just was so imaginative and creative in what he was doing and so long-term storytelling it is just truly astonishing to see what he did in that time period in the window of the Wyatt family and how it grew into you know when a character that they're portraying on tv takes off that more larger than life persona Mm -hmm. and that's something he did and and ran with and this and to go into those different variations of that character with the fiend and then when he returned um in his most recent run it is just truly astonishing just to see how much an impact he's left and just, you know, how he made that connection with the fans. And it's something that I always love seeing him perform. I always love seeing just how his mind was going and about bringing such something like the Firefly Funhouse that should not have worked and made it into something that will stand the test of time. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and just you know, it's just, it's, this is a terrible tragedy. And, you know, like I say, I echo everybody's statements, you know, our thoughts and positive energy out to his family, friends, and fans all over the world. Yeah. So, uh, condolences to the friends, family, fans of, uh, both the legendary Terry Funk and Bray Wyatt. Uh, we're going to have a brief moment of silence before we get into the show. It's time! Well, unfortunately, the show has to go on. It always has. It always sucks to have start off on a somber moment, but we have a lot of wrestling action to talk about here. And uh, let's jump right in, shall we? Because this past Saturday, uh, from Wembley Stadium and London, England, the biggest event in wrestling history was the actual tagline. 
And that, of course, would be AEW Presents All In. Uh, like I said, it's from Wembley Stadium. A reported paid attendance of 81,035. Uh, I'm going to say this right up front because uh, I know we're going to get the whole thing. As you know here, we don't dive in the weeds about tickets. I, I don't care. I care about the product in the ring. I will say this, though, because then somebody will be like, well, you don't, you say you call it right down the middle, but you didn't call it right down the middle about the tickets. No, I did because I, I believe what they gave us. It was a paid attendance of 81,035. Mm-hmm. Okay, so here's the thing. If it's a paid attendance, that means they just went with the number they made, they made at the box office. So if you saw empty seats, that could mean numerous things. It could mean somebody didn't make it because uh, they, they didn't get flights there. Right. Because maybe coming from out of town, maybe mm-hmm. somebody, some of the people were sick. Hell, maybe some people, maybe scalpers got some of the tickets and they didn't resell. Yeah. There's, there's numerous things that could happen or it could be one of these conspiracy theories that you guys are throwing around. It's not our business. It doesn't affect what we thought about the show. Mm-hmm. So we're going to go with the 81,035 number as gospel. I will just say this. If it, if you're really that concerned about it, you have a year, and then you'll see it again when next time they come to us live from Wembley, you know what 81,000 is supposed to look like at Wembley. That's all I'm saying. And I'm not, and I, I don't, th- I have no other reason than to believe that the paid attendance for this thing was 81,035. Mind you, they didn't say the in person attendance. They right. said paid attendance. So there it is. Paid attendance. Biggest show in wrestling history, according to uh, in the know. However, uh, they also made, uh, t- what is it, $10 million at the gate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, that uh, defeated uh, Korea's two day record of 85, 8.5 million, by the way, is the non WWE professional wrestling record because WrestleMania pretty much breaks that every year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Including this year where they haven't even finished selling tickets and WrestleMania is at $23 million at the gate thus far. But still, listen, big bucket of win. It has nothing to do with WWE. It's all about AEW. I know everybody likes to get tribal. Listen to MJF mm-hmm. when he told everybody, hey, Wrestling is winning right now. Be happy. If you don't like something, don't watch it. Uh, if not, just you know, just be positive because don't take away from the win. All in was a is, was a box office success because that you know if you're making over ten million dollars in uh, in gate money and you sell eighty one thousand tickets to the show, I think that's a success. Oh, absolutely. The, you can't take it away. AEW had a big weekend, and that's what should be the story. Unfortunately, there's other stories to that, but we're not going to worry about those mm-hmm. stories till later because right. that's going to come in more. For all out, because yeah. we're going to talk about that after all in. Uh, so let's uh, let's go ahead and let's jump into the show. First of all, there was two matches on the zero hour. Uh, there was a two hour pre show for this, but the only the uh, the noon hour was where the matches happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wish they would have played some of the video packages they played in the first hour of zero hour and in the preview show that I was on TNT the night before during the matches. I thought they would have looked better than the shorter ones that they gave us. Mm-hmm. Just. Just a production note. I'm also going to go off on the thing just to say at one time, production for this show. <sighs> yeah. Like, there was times where guys were going for moves and they cut to the crowd. Like, if you guys are talking about smash cuts for WWE, I don't know, man. At one point in Juncture, the match is literally going on. It's hot and heavy in the ring, and they switch over to mercedes Monet. Yep. And they did that with Don Callis, too. And they did it for Don Callis, yeah. The Don Callis one was even worse because I do believe Takeshita was going for, like, a meteor in the corner, mm-hmm. and they cut away from him going for the meteor, which he hit, to go over to Callis for no reason. And I was like, man, if, for everybody who complains about, you know, the other channel, whew, yeah, guys, get your stuff together on, that, uh, on those cameras. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to crap on it anymore because, once again... We all know that I don't like the production. Mm-hmm. Still, still stands. I can't believe more people don't complain about it because I see every time WWE's live, they're complaining about it. It's the same. Yeah, it's it a- really is. Actually, WWE doesn't miss those shots. At least they just do fifteen different cuts for that <laughs> shot. Yeah, you know, so it does get annoying. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to defend one and curse the other, but still, guys, gotta do better. Refereeing during this event, man. I'm still waiting to hear Bully Ray's opinion. You know, they banned him from, they basically banned him from Busted Open all week so far. Mm-hmm. I think uh, Tony Khan was like, don't have him on here. Because, man, we'll talk about during the matches. The referees, whoo, <laughs> they look kind of silly this weekend. Uh, but other than that, let's talk about the event. I thought the event was good. I know Ken also, so we'll break into it. Zero hour, first match on the zero hour for the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Championships. Your champions. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Oi, 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 oi. The Aussie Open, Kyle Fletcher and Mark Davis defending the titles against Better Than You. Baby. MJF and Adam Cole. Baby. 
Of course, this match only got 7 minutes and 45 seconds, which I'm going to talk about in a second. At the end of the day, and your new Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champions. Better than you. Baby. There you go. Uh, so, MJF and Adam Cole, I will say this. What I liked about this match, it was a good match. We finally got to see the kangaroo kick. Mm-hmm. I'm in. They won with the double clothesline. I'm fine with that. Yeah. I thought it was very entertaining. I liked the story bit in this match that a lot of people missed over. Aussie Open worked MJF's neck, Mm -hmm. which MJF would then sell later on in the night in the main event when we talk about that. So I like that. We we talked about it before that the plan might have been to get MJF in the ring and soften him up a little bit from Adam Cole's perspective. They definitely gave us that in this match. My problem is seven minutes and 45 seconds and you defeat one of the best tag teams on the planet? Yeah, I did not like that. I'm not a big fan of that. And and it is what it is. And somebody would, well, Rich, there's a lot planned. This was zero hour. This you, was, And I understand they're wrestling in the main event later tonight and they're wrestling certain time. But you should, uh, like, at least 15 minutes. It's the risk you ran having your main event competitors in a pre-show match. I understand for the storyline purpose. I do. But business-wise, it was still a risk. So I get why they went short, but then again, it's like, why did you do it at all then? Yeah. It kind of makes me wonder because you said the pre-show was what, two hours? Well, technically, yes, but the matches only took place in the noon hour. Right. So I, I know it's a big thing and it's a, it's a pain in the you-know-what when during the main card, when, when a match goes over or goes short, it causes all sorts of havoc, all sorts of you-know-what. But this is early enough that like it's not that detrimental if, heaven forbid, they go over by couple minutes that like oh it throws the whole show off no like you might have to cut a talking segment down by five minutes or something but ah shucks you're not really hurt at the in a pre-show one at that right so you're not really hurt at the end of the day give them a little bit more time i mean the internet and the fans are hot for mjf and adam cole baby you know into tag team and in storyline let it play out let them have fun exactly and once again i think it does a big disservice to the former champions in my opinion. Mm. That's just my opinion. But I thought the match was still serviceable for the 7 minutes and 45 seconds. It did what it needed to do storyline-wise. At the end of the day, we got new champions. Uh, the only other match we got in the uh, Zero Hour was for the FTW Championship under FTW Rules. Uh, your FTW, your unrecognized FTW champion, Hook. <laughs> yeah. Or no, sorry. Sorry. Jack Perry coming in. Lost to Hook. So you your new FTW champion, even though it's unrecognized, is Hook. Once again, via submission. You know, good stuff. It was a decent match. It serviced what it was supposed to. I would have. There was other matches I would have put on this card over this. I probably would have saved this for all out, in my opinion. The only notable thing is we're going to talk about it later, but we'll give you the little tease here. Only notable thing in this is before uh, taking a, a, a dump onto a uh, windshield that was broken, Jack Perry, for whatever reason, decided to take a shot at CM Punk by knocking on the glass and saying, "Hey, this is real glass. Cry me a river." Yeah. And that uh, led to some problems that we'll talk about later. Don't worry, we're going to get to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I guess for this one, well, they needed to fill time. I mean, I'm sorry, let me be honest. They have not done anything with this title to really give it some value to the fans. And I understand they're doing this to put Jack Perry over, but it's not working. You can't recapture the magic of this belt by just making it uh, an undercard title. I'm sorry, like that is what it is. Well, it's not even just an under, it's not even recognized. Yeah. Yeah. It's an unsanctioned belt to begin with. So, I mean, it is, you know, whatever. I mean, guess consolation prize for Jack Perry, you know, and and like Hook just uses that as a prop, which is fine. Mm -hmm. Although they should be doing more with Hook. I mean, he's over. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the argument you have. Like I say, I understand what they're doing. Like I say, it's just my opinion about it, but I just think that this has just been a waste of time period. Right. But once again, serviceable match, not going to complain too much. Let's dive into the main card of the show. Opening contest was for the... AEW Real World Championship, your champion, CM Punk, a.k.a. Pepsi Phil, Mm -hmm. going against the Samoan Submission Machine and your Ring of Honor World Television Champion, and by that being the king of TV, Samoa Joe. Uh, The match at the end of the day got 14 minutes, and your winner, and still AEW Real World Champion, 
CM Punk. And uh, you know, it was fitting to call him Pepsi Phil because he won this match with the Pepsi Plunge. We haven't seen that in a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, this match was really good. Um, once again, I, I questioned this coming in going, hey, we just did this. Why are we running this back? But then I also said, hey, it'll be a good match. This was a good match. There were some really cool spots in this match. I liked some of the, the better nuance they did. I mean, one point in juncture, Samoa Joe put CM Punk through the front of the commentating booth yeah. uh, with like a big like swing through it. It looked really cool. Cool. Like privacy plunge for the win, dug it. Anytime you get these two guys in the ring, it's going to be magic. What's your thoughts on the match, Ken? Agreed with you. Perfect way to kick off the show. They brought out some new tricks because this has been the original fight forever. So I was not mad about this match at all, and it did what it needed to do. Got me hyped up for the show. Pat, any thoughts? No, a good good match for opening the show. You know, got the crowd into it. You know, match the crowd over there has been wanting to see for a while. You know, it's been a while since they've seen a match up uh, together. You know, so uh, over there in England. So, hey, good for them. Next up, six-man tag team extravaganza. The Bullet Club Gold, represented by Juice Robinson and Switchblade Jay White, tagging with Takeshita with Don Collis, not necessarily in his corner as he was on commentary, Mm -hmm. but for whatever reason, Austin and Colton Gunn were allowed to second him to the ring. Yeah. Uh, They defeated the Golden Elite team of Kenny Omega, Kodai Ibushi, and Hangman Adam Page in 20 minutes, 30 seconds. A little cheap roll-up for Takeshita on Omega, which has now set up a match, which we'll talk about later, for All Out. Uh, this match, I'll, I'll tell you what, the MVP in the, to this match to me was Hangman Adam Page. Mm-hmm. Agreed. This was a match where I kind of went, man, they really dropped the ball with Adam Page. Because, remember, he was supposed to be the big baby face. He was supposed to be the face of the company, kind mm-hmm. of, in a lot of ways. And, like, he, when he was champion and the build to it, and even after, they they kind of treated it like an afterthought. And I, I never sat with me well. Get to this match. There were some chemistry issues between some people, but man, uh, Hangman Adam Page really kind of brought it. He was the most impressive in the ring to me, not taking anything away from anybody else. I thought the match was good. Your thoughts about it, Ken? I thought the match was okay. Um, I agree with you. I think Hangman Adam Page was doing really good work in there. I thought a couple spots were just off timing, and, and you know this happens, and especially I think once the crowd and the emotions are going, sometimes this happens and just didn't sync up as well. Um, I agree with you about the production issues because, like I said, they cut away a couple times to show Don Callis, and this is like prime opportunity to catch something in the ring. But it is what it is, and like I say, um, I thought the, I thought the right team won here too, setting up something. Anything you want to add, Pat? I don't know. I mean, the whole thing with Adam Page, you know, the build up to with to him winning the belt, the greatest story in pro wrestling history ever. And then he won the belt. And what happened? Exactly. You know, so it's not a surprise that, you know, they're not really sure what to do with him. Yeah, it's just it kind of blows my mind because he's never he never does bad work. No, in my opinion. He's solid. Uh, next up. The AEW World Tag Team Championships on the line. Your champions, the FTR, Dax Harwood, and uh, Cash Wheeler's Got a Gun. Uh, By the way, that that wonderful singing from the... uh the British, uh, mm-hmm. the, the crowd chanted, just singing Wheeler's Got a Gun oh, God. Was, was pretty funny. Uh, then, uh, of course, they defended those titles against the Young Bucks, Matt and Nick Jackson. Of course, this was the third match between them and AEW. We've waited a long time for this match. This match would get a total of 21 minutes, 45 seconds. And at the end of the day, and still your AEW World Tag Team Champions, the FTR. I'm going to say this, and it's going to be controversial, kind of. I might be, and I don't know, maybe London was too, because they, they, they took pictures, and there's pictures and videos of people going to the bathrooms during this match. True story. I'm not making this mm-hmm. shit up. <laughs> and uh, maybe, maybe I'm not the only one that's got a little bit of Young Buck fatigue. And then what I mean by that is the Young Bucks have pretty much been wrestling the same match for 15 years. And I'm sorry, it's true. It's, you know, I, I've, I've always made the joke when we're watching in person that somebody should really start the same old shit chant. Maybe they'll do it in Chicago this week. So any of the people going to All Out, if you can get that chant going, it would be amazing with, during the Young Bucks match if they have one. I'm assuming now they have to. We'll talk about that later. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it, all things about respect them, great tag team and everything. But this match just felt like a Young Bucks called match. Uh, I think out of the trilogy, this was the worst out of them. I'm not saying it was bad. I thought it was good. However, once again, they don't end on the logical ending. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, you know, FTR gives the, you know, about 15 minutes this, a little after, gives the uh, BTE trigger, followed by a shatter machine to Nick Jackson, which, and then he kicks out it too. Strongly kicks out it too. 
And then later on, we get, a, you know, now we get into the whole boom, 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 hit different finishers, hit different things, do the old Young Bucks, you know, barrage, fucking pinfalls and shortness right back to back to back. And then all of a sudden, all right, well, uh, we're going to hit the BT trigger on Cash Wheeler and go for the pin. One, two, almost three. And then Nick Jackson pulls the arm up. But I don't know if he pulled the arm up to insult the FTR. Like, oh, I'm not done with you because he didn't taunt after. Or if it was because, for whatever reason, Cash Wheeler wasn't kicking out, maybe he really got knocked out. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It was weird. It made no sense. But the three count was coming. And if Nick Jackson doesn't pull the arm up, it's a three new champions. So they, you know, trash can Dax out of the ring. And then they hit another... Uh, uh, BT, or they hit the BT trigger again, and this time they hit the shatter machine after on to old Cash Wheeler, and Wheeler kicks out of two. Yeah. So the BT trigger puts him out. They have to raise, lift his arm up for whatever reason. I don't know. Maybe there's more to this story. And but it looked really weird on TV, and nobody could explain it because even the even the commentators were like, and the commentators did a good job of covering a lot of stuff up. Oh yeah, kudos, uh, to kudos, them. hats off to Nigel McGuinness, Taz, and Excalibur, and even Jim Ross a little bit earlier, uh, even though he didn't know Freddie Mercury was no longer with us. Yeah, there he brought Freddie Mercury back from the dead is the joke going around because uh, he had one point asked if he was still around, and uh, Excalibur goes, well. Certain ways he is, yes. <laughs> Yikes. So kudos to Excalibur. Yeah. I love you, Excalibur, and all your greatness. But I think Nigel McGuinness was actually the the the, the, oh, he was the MVP. plus MVP. But yeah. I think everybody did great in the commentary. I'm just gonna throw that out there. But even they were like, "What? What just happened? I don't understand what we just saw." And shortly after, we got the finish. And I will give it this: I like the finish. The springboard. Nick Jackson goes for a springboard and gets caught in a shatter machine. It looked really cool. Mm-hmm. And the one, two, three. FTR comes up. They go. They offer the hands to the Bucks. The Bucks refuse to shake their hands and walk off. You know. So this continues on, which is fine. You know, it's the tag team fight forever. I just. I don't know, man. I, I I just want to see something different. It went on too long. And I agree. Like, we get to a point, and we've talked about this on past episodes. It's like you get to that 20-minute range or 15-minute range, and it's like it's the perfect time to wrap things up. You do a big spot finish, and yet we keep going. And it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And I think that that's the problem that you had here because once they did that sequence from going from the BTE trigger to the Shatter Machine, like, that should have been it. So why are we doing all these extra moves in, in big spots when it's not needed and the crowd clearly here, in my opinion, started turning out? Agreed. I think that's true. And I, here's the other thing. It makes your finish look like it's an easy thing to kick. It doesn't protect it, your finish. Yeah. And now, mind you, two different people kicked out of the shatter machine. And, you know, the argument always is, well, the Young Bucks did the one time. And it's never the same when somebody else does it. But still, in that match, two people kicked out of the shatter machine. Mm-hmm. And that move was one of the most protected moves in wrestling. Yeah. I'm not saying other people haven't kicked out of it because we've seen it before. Sure. But but this just didn't make sense to me, in no, my personal opinion. No, just too much. Pat, any thoughts? No, I mean, the, the whole thing with the Young Bucks, it was cool the first couple times I saw them, you know, on the indie shows, you know, 10 plus years ago. But now it's it's, it's almost you can set your watch to it and and you can sit there with a, ch- with a checklist of all of their moves and finishers and you can just slowly check them off one by one by one by one until you get to the end and go, all right, we about reached the point where they should finish, but no, nope, we're going to go for another five minutes. We do have to give them full credit, though. They did come out dressed as Freddie Mercury. Yes. That was cool. Uh, although I was not a fan of the super kick knocks you out. Super kick knocks you out. Yeah. They did this little thing in the beginning. Thing. It was weird, and I didn't get it, and I'm just kind of like, uh, if that was your idea, that was that was your big entrance, it didn't work for me. I'm just I, I agree. It was confusing. Let's move on, though. Next up was the stadium stampede match. And uh, the team of Eddie Kingston, Penta El Zero Mato, best friends, Sexy Chucky T, and Tramperetta, and, of course, your AEW international champion, Orange Cassidy, who got the pinfall, by the way, uh, defeated the Blackpool Combat Club team of John Moxley, Claudio Castagnoli, and Wheeler Yuta. And then, of course, they were teaming with Mike Santana and Ortiz, formerly the Proud and the Powerful, amongst a million other names. This match got 21 minutes, 30 seconds. I will say this. This match was what I called a baby death match. Mm. I know they brawled all over the arena, but what got people's eyes was the skewers that John Moxley took to the head. Penta El Zero Mato gave him the skewers. I'm like, anybody who's watched Deathmatch Wrestling, that's not new. That's been around for about 20 years now. Yeah. 
So it's kind of weird that like people were aghast about it. I'm like, eh. and once again, I get it. Or aghast that uh, Orange Cassidy <laughs> did the Taipei glass on his uh, fist before giving the orange punch. I don't know. I, I for me, I, the match was entertaining and serviceable as a gimmick match. I think it went too long, and some of it just didn't make sense. Like Eddie Kingston just disappeared. For yeah. The, I don't know. We were like, is Eddie Kingston hurt or something? Because I haven't seen him in like He just disappears. Minutes. Like earlier yeah. in the match, then you don't see him for a while. And then he comes out and gives a couple back fists and throws Moxley through a uh, barbed wire uh, door or table or board or whatever it was. Whatever I couldn't it make was. it out. But yeah, it was interesting. I'm, I'm not mad about the match, but also as a person who watches Deathmatch Wrestling, I'm kind of like, eh, it wasn't nothing to write home about, Ken. We knew this was going to be a human demolition derby. It always is. It's it, there's no real way to grade it, so to speak. Um, I just thought we got what we expected, and I do agree with you. It was a baby death match. I think the skewers might have shocked some that are AEW faithfuls and don't watch anything like GCW or other federations. But I thought it was just confusing at at, point, at one point too, especially with the Penta transformation. Oh yeah, when he came out as Penta Obscura all of a sudden, yeah, with different music, <laughs> yeah. Which I mean, <laughs> and broke the ladder. Yeah, he climbed up the wrong side of a ladder. They didn't buy the double sided ladders. They oh, brought one that's a normal one. And as he was climbing up the ladder, just went and they both went off the ladder. <laughs> yeah, so it did what it needed to do, I guess. Um, I mean, I was entertained, but I do agree with you. Like Eddie Kingston disappearing, uh, that was confusing because all of a sudden he comes running back in, and then the Penta transformation was like, wait, what? Because nobody course, knew what was going on. We forgot about Sue. Sue and her oh, not, now right. Mercedes white van. Yes. And she delivered cookies that were used as a weapon. I'm kind of like, why didn't she run somebody over with a van? Yeah. I don't know. It's weird. It's weird stuff. Pat, I'm just telling you, it's weird stuff. It, and it is. I mean, the, this whole match style has never done much for me. I mean, the only way you can really sell me on it and get me interested to watch it is if you do a super cut of all of them, cut out the audio, and just put the Benny Hill theme music to it. Because in, in instances like this, Ken has verified this be- with me before. Anytime you have backstage shenanigans like this and you put the Benny Hill theme music to it, it makes it a thousand times better. Thousands. It's true. So, it's not a lie. I mean, hey, internet, there you go. Run, uh, with, run with it. Also, I want to say this is this match did a big disservice doing it in the live venue uh, because I don't think it works out as well. It was always done in empty stadiums before. Mm-hmm. Yep. And the other problem with this is that, you know, we're not harping on it, but there's the, the, you know, the ticket conspirators or whatever. This gave them all the ammo because they fought in sections where there was like sporadic seating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Nigel tried to cover it up. I look at, they're all running out of the way. And it's like, nobody was running. Listen, uh, A, nobody was running and there was nobody bunched up at one end. Mm -hmm. We know what it looks like because whenever you go to an independent show, especially if you're like a game changer wrestling, when the action gets near you, they tell you to get the F out of the way. Yeah. And so you always are bunched at one one end or the other, and that wasn't there. It's was just they, I mean, they picked the right section because, you know, they didn't have to clear anybody out, but it was just kind of like, you just gave ammo to your detractors, and I just don't understand why that was a thing. Mm-hmm. I agree. You should never give ammo to the detractors. It's stupid. Because you know they're going to take advantage of it because they're just looking to find anything because they're they're not wrestling fans. They're just looking to piss, and, you know, talk shit. And they, you gave them the ammo. Mm-hmm. Uh, so at the end of the day, it was decent, but I, I don't, it didn't really make me over yeah. the hill. Next up, Four-way match for the AW Women's World Championship. Your champion, Sheeta, defending against Tony Storm, Dr. Britt Baker, D.M.D., and, of course, England's own Soraya. This match got eight minutes and 50 seconds. Yeah. And at the end of the day, and your new AEW Women's World Champion, Soraya. Uh, first of all, Soraya came out to... Uh, we will rock you by Queen with her whole family to a mild crowd at best. Mm-hmm. I want to point out, Tony Storm came out to uh, Hail Britannia. So she comes out because obviously she's from Australia, but she made her name in wrestling in England to booze, yeah. which is good because she's a heel. And then Britt Baker got a pop and she got the biggest pop. During the match, Sheeta and Britt Baker got all the pops. Mm-hmm. Sheeta being the loudest, Britt Baker being second loudest. I think that crowd really wanted to see Sheeta defend that title. Mm-hmm. Uh, clunky match. They didn't give him enough time. Right. And not clunky because of the women. I thought the women did fine. They did fine. But I think they were rushing into spots because they had sub 10 minutes, which is a problem. You had, you know, in here, I'm going to say this is, you know, we don't like to compare stuff, but let's be honest. At SummerSlam, when we had the triple threat match with. Uh, Bianca Belair, Asuka, and Charlotte Flair 
for the the Universal mm-hmm. Women's Title. There was a lot of people going, but they only had one women's match on the card. That match got twenty one minutes. Yeah. Plus, we got the EO Sky stuff at the end, right? Mm-hmm. That and, and one of the, you know that match could be it was we just talked about it when we did SummerSlam, and I want to dive in. Where it was a clunky match for other reasons. They looked like they were off, except for the finish was really good because Bianca Belair pulled her best Willis Reed, and then the, the surprise cash in. However, people complained. That was all over the internet. People asked Triple H about this. Yeah. Where was the internet complaining that there was only one match on All In for the women? And it got eight minutes and fifty seconds. And when a when a reporter asked about it, yep, Tony, Khan, do you have Tony Khan's statement? I do. Tony, Khan, so what did, did you, does it have the question? It doesn't. And I okay. was doing, and I know it was somebody asked it, and I was so, trying to do my best to look up who it was, but let I can't. Me, find let me it. do the paraphrase. I know the paraphrase. The the young woman asked, and I don't know who did. So sorry, can't give her credit. But the young woman asked. There was only one women, women's match on All In. Why wasn't there any others? Was there plans for it? They got cut. Kind of that to that degree. And the answer from Tony Khan was what, Pat? Quote, well, we've announced Ruby versus Chris Statlander for the TBS championship. We'll have to see what kind of condition Soraya is in coming out of this match. It's a great question. A lot of the card tonight was both featuring as many of the top stars in AEW as I could get. So a lot of the biggest stars in the company were not on this show. That's why we have big matches like Miro versus Powerhouse Hobbs and obviously Ruby Soho versus Chris Statlander next week. I think the pacing of the show tonight was probably the best we've ever had. So to add more, I think would have been challenging. But also, we have so many great stars across both the men's and women's division. Great wrestlers, close quote. Yeah, and then he, actually he would circle back around, and you don't have to go into that. He would circle back around to talk about the pacing being great. Like, I paced this show very well, and I didn't I didn't think that it needed anything else. And then they would also, he'd also tag in there at some point in juncture that, well, the first all-in had a four-way women's match that Britt Baker was in, so we were paying homage. And I'm just like, <sighs> mm-hmm. meanwhile, this is the same guy, remember, when asked about women's wrestling before, just instantly threw a temper tantrum that he threw people to the NWA's all-women's pay-per-view. Uh, I just want to throw out there, I'm, I once again, we don't like to compare the two companies because we're not that show, but let's keep the same energy, folks, because there's some of you who questioned WWE for one women's match. Yep. They got 21 minutes, and it was a damn good match by the end of it. Meanwhile, AEW's biggest event biggest event in wrestling history, right? Mm-hmm. And they got four women in a four-way for eight minutes and 50 seconds when the matches before, 21-30, 21-45, 20-30, 14-14. Matches after, just so you know. Oh, sorry, there was one match. Oh, no, it was the shortest match of the card. Next match got 16 minutes. The match after that, 14-55. The match after that, which was closest to it, was 10-50. And the main event got 29 minutes. So you're telling me we couldn't have found them an extra, like, you know, five minutes? Where, where, where do we even begin here? Um, if this is your biggest show of the year, right, mm-hmm. wouldn't you have every single big star on your roster here? You would think. Okay, so to the I'm sorry, like in my opinion, I disagree with that wording. Um, just it's a disservice. I'm sorry, and this this should have got more time, and you could have definitely juggled around a few of the matches on the card. Because I, I I don't think the pacing is on point, as he's saying. That's just my opinion of it. I agree with but, you, though. But, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. You can't compare this to WWE. And like I said, we don't do that. But to make that statement, I'm sorry. This match was very short, and I think that all four women in the ring did what they could do in that amount of time. And that's why I said when I used the word clunky in this case, it wasn't on the women. Right. I think they were trying to cram a 15-minute match into right. – sub 10 minutes. Right. And and I felt really bad for them at the end of the day because there was some really good storytelling going on in this match. Mm-hmm. The Tony Storm Soraya interactions were really good, especially when, you know, Tony Storm accidentally hit Soraya's mom at ringside and then Ruby would come down and, and get ran off. And I feel like when we went to the end of the match, the, the one of the things that I think that, I'm not blaming Britt Baker for this. I think she wasn't thinking because I think she was just like, oh shit, we got to get to the end of the match because she has, she did the lock jaw and at the same time, she has sheet in the lockjaw. Uh, basically, Saray uses the spray paint can and gets the roll up win on uh, Tony Storm. Yeah. And I thought that it would have been. And then right before the three count, you know, Britt lets go of the submission, like like she's going to go over there. And I'm like, no, no, no. She should have left the submission on. They should have had sheet a tap at two. And then, of course, the referee's not seeing because they're counting the match. So that way, we could instantly set up the match between Britt Baker 
and Soraya for the AEW Women's World Title because right. Britt could say, "Hey, wait a minute, she tapped before you counted three. Mm. We have the video evidence." And I think that maybe that I don't know if that was the plan or not, but maybe it could have been. And I think that they just were like, "Oh shit, we got to get, we got to go to finish." Right. And like Soraya's family came in, and there was a nice celebration, but. I, the crowd just wasn't behind her at all. No. Even at the end, there was some nice clapping and, you know, but you could see people visibly behind her kind of just like standing there like, eh, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I don't know. And we've said before on the show that, you know, Vince McMahon and WWE created this fairy tale story of Paige. Right. And it's not necessarily true in the UK. And I think we found that out. And I'm going to say, because we get to a couple matches next, we had up to this point thought that the crowd, maybe this noise was not you know, loud enough because outside open air, mm -hmm. right? We're going to find out in the next few matches that that wasn't necessarily the case. I mean, I'm not saying they weren't, they were quiet. They weren't, they were loud, but it wasn't as loud as it could get. And when you hear the pop that we're going to talk about in two matches, when we talk about that, it really makes you realize that maybe they weren't behind Soraya winning at all. Yeah. Just going to say that. And I, I mean, it is what it is. You can't go back in time. Uh, there were some mistakes being made, but before we get that, we got a nice little pop here because the coffin match. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, I want to go on record. Myself and Ken both said this could be the sleeper of the event. And although I don't think it was the best match of the night, it was the sleeper of the event. Uh, yes. It was one of the most entertaining Thousand matches. Thousand percent facts. It got, it got uh, what was I say, 16 minutes. And at the end of the day, Darby Allen and Sting would defeat Swerve Strickland and Christian Cage. Of course, Swerve Strickland and Christian Cage, or well, Swerve Strickland in particular, would get wrapped to the ring. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Christian would come out with his uh, not-earned TNT championship. Yeah. But then the awesomeness came. Mm -hmm. Sting walking the streets of London and dressed like Jack the Ripper. With a little bit of Joker flair. Yes. With Darby being like, oh, I guess it's time. And Sting's like, it's not just time. It's showtime. And it like sounded cheesy, but the lights go out. And when the lights come back on, we hear the... <laughs> we got Seek and Destroy. And I was marking. I was yeah. like, yes. And uh, the, 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 the different face paint from the video even... Sting looked amazing as Joker Sting. Yes. Darby's face paint looked, and they and they didn't do the whole skateboarding, whatever. They walked to the ring with purpose. Mm -hmm. I loved this entrance because it was like, we're coming to fight and we're gonna beat the hell out of you two. And by the way, we're gonna do it to seek and destroy. I I was it was just perfect for me. I marked out a little bit. And this match delivered. We said it, this match had no reason being as good as it was. Mm -hmm. Sting did great. Found the Fountain of Youth again for a match. Thankfully, he didn't do anything too crazy in this match. Darby Allen, on the other hand, as we pointed out, was going to do it. Dude, oh, coffin man. dropped from the top turnbuckle to the floor onto a casket. Indented the casket. And nice. it was a real casket. It wasn't it a was, gimmick it casket. It was a big dent. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, man. I, I hope he, he's he got to slow it down a little bit. He's going to be in a wheelchair before tw like two to three years. But, oh, my God, it was a great match. I loved, I loved the drama of the match. Mm -hmm. Swerve Strickland was an MVP of this match. Swerve Strickland needs a title belt by the end of the year. He is your uncrowned future star of your company. I'm sorry. He did a fantastic job in this, and I want to see him get into a title picture somewhere, even if he has to go after Christian Cage. I don't even care. Great match. Fantastic. The entrance. This is why we have pay-per-views that are events, not just you know specialty shows. This gave, the uh, at least for me, the first time the entire night, that big fight feel. I agree with that, you. That this was something special. And I thought this was the best Darby has looked in his entire time in AEW. I'm going to say it on record. I thought that this is like, okay, now I understand why you call him a pillar. Right. Well, I'm also going to say, the reason I think this gave you the big match feel is we had both sides. I mean, not Christian, but Swerve had a special entrance. Mm -hmm. We had Darby and Sting have a special entrance. I mean, other than the uh, the only other special entrances we got was that super kick knock you out thing, which is weird. Yeah, but... And, and I didn't like, but some people might have. That's fine. Sure. And then Soraya coming out to We Will Rock You. But once again, that was one person. This is the first match of the night... Where that, and this is also the first match where we heard how loud the crowd could uh -huh, really be. Exactly. Because they, of course, popped for Sting. And right. I think they popped even more for so Seek and Destroy Sting. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you're giving the nostalgia. You know, and now I think Tony Khan deserves a ton of credit for going, hey, for this big event, we should do Seek and Destroy. Perfect. Good for him. And I, I mean that wholeheartedly. Absolutely. Uh, the next match, though, was easily the match of the night. Mm -hmm. The next match was Will Osprey, the Billy Goat. With Don Callis in his corner, defeated 
Chris Jericho with Sammy Guevara in his corner. This match got 14 minutes, 55 seconds. And I don't mind saying this is my best, my favorite match of the night. And this is where we learned how loud the crowd truly could be. Holy, well, first of all, talk about big match feel. You have Chris Jericho singing himself to the ring with Judas. And it was cool. Yeah. I'll give it credit. Fozzie was playing him in. They were on top of the set. Right. I, by the way, I loved the set. The LED set with the tunnel mm-hmm. that you could see with the light, the, the videos on both sides. That was great. I, I loved the set for All In. Uh, but yes, it was amazing. And then you get to the other side and we get this beautiful piano piece of like the opening of Elevated. And then all of a sudden it kicks in. And once it kicks in, the entirety of Wimbley comes alive. The pop for Will Osprey. I don't think anybody realized how loud the English crowd was truly going to be because the match was kind of set up that Jericho was going to be the face. Mm-hmm. And we'll get to that. In a, I'll get to that in a second. But that pop, man. Oh, my God. I got goosebumps during that pop. And then they were singing Elevated. Mm-hmm. It was like 81,000 people, if you will, cheered at one time for Will Osprey. They're, and when he got in the ring, they were still cheering for him. Mm-hmm. They were doing the, oh, Will Osprey. It was amazing. It, like, it was as loud as Money in the Bank was. And I understand Money in the Bank was indoors, so it's easier to capture that. But they were loud. They really wanted Will Osprey in this match. And he, they got him to the credit of, of Chris Jericho. As soon as he realized the crowd wasn't on his side, he started doing heel stuff. Yep. And I loved it. That's the that's the definition of a veteran. Let's give let's give the flowers to Chris Jericho. Mm-hmm. He found the fountain of youth in this match. He didn't look like you know fifty something year old Chris Jericho. He looked like he was back in the prime of his career, his thirties. Chris Jericho. He kept up with Will Asprey for the most part. There's a couple times where they're a little off, but once again, the guy who's one of the best wrestlers in the world in his early thirties. And, you know, it, you know, still has his whole career ahead of him pretty much mm-hmm. against the guy who's 50-some years old. I mean, I, I'm not going to hold that against Jericho, but there was a sequence in this match where uh, Osprey goes for an os cutter. Jericho goes for a Judas effect and misses. Osprey goes for a hidden blade and misses. They end up rolling through, and, and then Jericho gets him in the walls of Jericho, mm-hmm. or the Lion Tamer even. Sorry, it wasn't even the walls. And I just went... That was phenomenal, just this chain wrestling that just happened between these two. Great match. And by the way, both. The last one he took was amazing. But both times that uh, that he took the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Stormbreaker. Stormbreaker. Thank you. I don't know why I was drawing a blank there. But both times that Jericho took the Stormbreaker, it looked amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first time was good, better than most people take it. The second time, it looked like Osprey killed him, and I thought it was great. And it was putting Osprey over. Osprey wins the match. It's beautiful. A star is born. I mean, honestly, if you were not sold on Will Osprey being arguably the best wrestler on the planet right now, <coughs> listen to that pop as he comes down to the ring. And he's like 31, 32. Yeah. He's young. Here's the thing, man. Tony Khan, you have an inside track a little bit. I'll tell you right now, get as much money as you can, load it in a Brinks truck, and dump it at his doorstep in January when his New Japan contract's up. Because I'm telling you right now, it's going to be a bidding war. Because after that pop, I guarantee you WWE's coming. Mm -hmm. They're going to want to sign Will Ospreay. That pop was that immense. They heard that pop all the way live in Stanford. Oh, yeah. Okay? Not not talking about, like, because they were watching. They heard the pop. Mm -hmm. It came across the ocean. It was loud. I, I... I mean, I knew they were going to pop for the, you know, the English guy. Oh, sure. But I didn't think it was going to be that levels. And you had seen other stars. You'd seen Kenny Omega, and they pop for Kenny. They pop for the Bucks. They pop, you know, they pop. They were popping. But when you heard them pop for Osprey, you're like, wow, nobody got that reaction. Kind of like when Bad Bunny came out and uh, yes, for for Backlash or whatever. Great it was, comparison. Where it's like, okay, you know, he's going to get a pop. He's the number one streaming artist on whatever platform you choose. The last like what three years running. So mm-hmm. it's like, okay, you know, he's going to get a pop. But then the music hits, you just hear the eruption. It's like, whoa. Yes, it was that level. It was really good. I and, and like I said, up to that point, I thought the sound was just escaping this. Mm-hmm. But tremendous match. Go out of your way to see if you haven't. Absolutely. All right, let's go. We got two more matches on the card. The next up was the House Rules match for the AEW World Trios Championships. Your champions, the House of Black, Malachi Black, Brody King, and Buddy Matthews with Julia Hart in the corner, taking on the acclaimed Anthony Bowens and Max Caster and badass Billy Gunn. Of course, the House Rules for this match chose by... The acclaimed of Billy Gunn were no holds barred. This match got 10 minutes and 50 seconds at the end of the day. And your new AEW Trios champion, Billy Gunn and the acclaimed. So Daddy Ass is back home 
Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the funniest thing I think that came out of this match, or most fun thing that came out, is that afterwards uh, uh, there was a tweet put out by one Anthony Bowen that said to MJF, hey, listen, I know your special relationship with my partner, uh, Ma uh, Max Caster. So uh, out of respect for that, I just want you to know that I scissored your dad at All In. Oh, and there's a picture of him scissoring yeah. uh, his dad. I, I thought it was it was a good match. It was fun. I didn't like the end, though. I like the, I liked the finish of the match. I didn't like the end where the House of Black handed them the belts. Yeah. So I thought that was a little weird because it's the House of Black. I don't know. They have a weird setup for that. I, I mean, I love the gimmick of House of Black. But I, but it, how they have their own rules, and I guess that was a way of giving them respect. It was what it was. I mean, I thought it was a gr it was a good match for where it was on the card. But I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing this get ran back sometime. All right, let's jump to the main event of the evening for the AW World Championship. Uh, your champion, Maxwell Jacob Friedman, MJF, defending against Adam Cole. Baby. Of course, both of them are the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champions. This match got 29 minutes at the end of the day, and still your AEW World Heavyweight Champion, MJF. This match had great storytelling. I love the storytelling of this match. Uh, you know, Adam Cole, and they, they had the little friendly. Of course, MJF went for a handshake the second time, then gave the eye poke to Adam Cole, but then apologized, helped him up, and then Adam Cole lost his shit. Mm -hmm. He took off the tag, he took off MJF's tag team shirt because they were wrestling their tag team shirts, and uh, he proceeded to beat his ass for a while, including giving him a brain buster on the steel steps, which almost cost uh, MJF not to get back in the ring by the count of 10. At one point, MJF would go for a tombstone on the table, but couldn't do it. But instead, Adam Cole would reverse it and successfully give him the tombstone on the table. And I'm building all this in because at one point in juncture, we got the double clothesline from the tag champs on each other. Arms draped over. Bryce Remsburg counts the three. And we get the bell ring. And we get an announcement that both men's arms were, both men were pinned. So therefore, the match is a draw. Yeah. The crowd was not happy. Mm. There was a lot of bullshit chants. And, uh, of course, they did a call back to the first match when Adam Cole said five more minutes, even though there wasn't a time limit. But still, he said five more minutes. And like he did the first time, MJF says no. But then he gets up and he goes, we're going to go until there's a fucking winner in Wembley. Crowd goes nuts. I was nervous that they were going to put the match off to all out. Mm. I swear to God to it. <laughs> I was like, this is, this is how they're going to end this. And I was getting ready to be mad. Thankfully, they did it. They restarted the match. And we get into a second half of this match. It was pretty good. Uh, I'll get to my problem in a minute. So eventually, Bryce Remsburg takes the, the dive. He gets knocked down first time. And uh, MJF goes to use the diamond ring. And he can't. So he puts it back in his tights. Adam Cole puts him down. Can't get the win because Bryce Remsburg was down because he gave him the outside of the ring uh, Panama Sunrise. Unfortunately, when the time he got him back in and Bryce came over, it was a kick out. He goes to give MJF the Panama Sunrise and uh, Bryce Remsburg ends up eating it. Instead, that brings out Roderick Strong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Roderick Strong, after MJF gets the upper hand, Roderick Strong kicks MJF in the dick and he's down. Of course, Adam Cole doesn't see it. But then Adam Cole sees Roderick Strong yelling at him to get up. He sees MJF is now down, which he wasn't down before. Bryce Remsburg is starting to stir. He's starting to get up. So he then takes off his T-shirt and gives a Panama Sunrise in the ring to MJF for a two count. Because once again, slow count. And I was fine with that. Because mm -hmm. Remsburg actually was selling being hurt. Yes. Then Roderick Strong slides in the AW Championship. Adam Cole looks like he's going to hit uh, MJF in the back of the head while he's on his knees with his back turned to him. And then decides not to. By the time he comes over to do something, MJF gives him the big quick uh, roll up or roll through. One, two, three, and still your champion, MJF. And then after the match, we got the part that I didn't mind. So the part that I mind before we get to the part that I thought was good was you've done a little cheap things all match, including kind of cheating when, you, you know, I know you didn't see MJF get kicked in the dick, but you knew something happened to him. And you're still okay to give him a Panama Sunrise after and try to get the win. Mm -hmm. But the belt was too far. Yeah. So I didn't like that part of it. But I did like the end because at the end, I, like part of it, I was kind of like, where are they going with this? At the end, MJF comes over to Adam Cole and suddenly he's like, listen, either of us could have won. You know, these people still love you. It's fine. You know, whatever. I just won tonight. It's no big deal. Like trying to like be nice to his friend. He's like, oh, I can fix it. He goes outside. He grabs the Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles. He hands them to... Uh, uh, you know, Cole and says, here, we're the tag champs to celebrate with our tag belts. Who cares about the other belt? And Cole grabs his, grabs MJF from him and throws both of them outside the ring, which MJF then triggers himself. And I thought this was the best part. Because mm -hmm. MJF looks at him and he's like, so you're not my friend. 
This whole time it was about that belt. You just wanted to sucker me in to win the belt. You know what? Take the fucking belt. And he throws the belt at him. Yeah. I was just like, wow. And he just starts. And the part that I really liked was the next part because he goes, I'm so fucking stupid. I'm stupid. I can't believe I let somebody do this to me again. And he goes, you know what? I'm I, Just hit, do it. Do what you're going to do. And he turns around and just stretches his arms out. And he says, do what you're going to do. Just at least be a man about it. Just hit me behind the, you know, just take me out with a belt. And Ryder Strong at this point juncture's like on the rope yelling at Cole to do hit it, him. Do it. Mm. And, and this is where the missed opportunity was. Not to hit MJF. He should have hit Roderick with yeah. the belt. It would have made more sense. Instead, he threw the belt down, and then we have the big hug, which the crowd popped for. We get the confetti and stuff. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, the kingdom's in the aisle way. So they flew the three of them to England for nothing? Yeah. I just, I don't get it. But I like the storytelling. Don't mm. get me wrong. I just don't like the clunkiness of it. No, the ending was, a little, like you said, it was a little clunky. And... Hopefully they can clean it up moving forward. I like how they didn't go. Maybe the, the surprise was everybody was expecting the heel turn by Adam Cole that week, and you know we didn't get it. So as long as this storyline keeps progressing like it is, I'm not mad about it. Much like I'm not mad about anything the Bloodline's doing right now. And not in just saying like this is AEW's Bloodline. Let's face it, this is the best storyline they've done. So if they want to keep it going, they can. Just this was a little messy in parts. I know a lot of people were expecting the heel turn just because when Cole came out in his ring gear, it was uh, based off of the villain Handsome Jack from the Borderlands video game series, who sees himself as a hero and like a savior to all, and that like he will stab, but he will stab anyone in the back that he has to to meet his own ends. Mm. In which Cole has said he's a big fan of the Borderlands series. So I know a lot of people saw that and figured, oh, he's coming out as handsome Jack. He's clearly going to he's clearly going to turn on MJF tonight. So uh, at least a fair number of people were believing in that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. Like I said, I, I thought overall the thought the main event was really good. The crowd was into it as well. Uh, overall, I thought the show was good. It was entertaining. It was a solid show. I mean, I don't think it's the greatest of all time as far as the top to bottom card, but I do think that there are some memorable moments and that's something that AEW should center around and take with them moving forward. So I will say this, we're going to, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but of course the big thing coming out once again, out of a big pay-per-view for AEW isn't just the card. It's an incident that happens backstage involving CM Punk. Brawl in. Although I will say this, I don't think this was on CM Punk. Mm -hmm. We mentioned earlier, Jack Perry made the comment about this is real glass, cry me a river. When he came back to the back, we're going by alleged reporting because we don't know. Uh, these are just, you know, kind of the pointers from a lot of different people. When he came to the back, basically, however, him and CM Punk came together. CM Punk asked him if he had a problem with him. Uh, Jack Perry allegedly said, you heard what I said out there. CM Punk told him, you got a lot of nerve. I should kick the shit out of you and then proceeded to push him. I don't know if Jack Perry like uh, tried to fight at all because before you know it, I guess he had him in a chokehold. Mm. Uh, CM Punk had Jack Perry in a chokehold yeah. and Samoa Joe broke it up. Allegedly, Miro stuck his nose into mm. it at some point. There's, It's a mess. We know now, according to Sports Illustrated, that both CM Punk and Jungle Boy Jack Perry, because I also call, he's all going to be Jungle Boy to me, mm. have been suspended. Now, funny story is SRS has already said, well, Punk doesn't know about this. They never informed him. But according to Pad, uh, you said the SI said that they informed his lawyer, correct? I've read that, yeah, his uh, lawyer has been informed. So it looks like he's suspended. Now, this upcoming week, it's upcoming Sunday to be exact, uh, September the 3rd, AEW returns the pay-per-view, but they more importantly return to Chicago, Illinois, and the United Center for AEW Presents All Out. Yeah. I, listen, first of all, I don't think Punk was in the wrong here. First of all, it's been public knowledge that Punk was not picked up from the airport from anybody from AEW. Mm -hmm. He took the tube. Fans helped him find his hotel and get to the arena. Yeah. That's unprofessional as hell. Leaving that alone. So he's already having a bad day. And then Jack Perry... Decides this is a good time to take a shot. Jack Perry, with no matter how what you feel about him, whether you like him or not, he definitely hasn't drawn what CM Punk has drawn. Mm -hmm. Why take the shot, especially on the night? Why go into business for yourself? Yeah. Now, once again, Punk could have handled it better by not confronting him. But at the same point in juncture, if you're already pissed off about the company not picking you up, and then some little Punk runs his mouth about you, and in this case, Punk's the bigger guy physically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Yeah. It has been noted that some people some people are reporting that uh, CM Punk cussed out Tony Khan in the locker room and quit. That's that, allegedly. That, allegedly, allegedly. Like allegedly. I said, I don't want to say that's where the, 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 I'm saying some people are reporting, not people I trust until I hear it from one of my trusted sources. It didn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do know for certain that Jack Perry was kicked out of the building pretty much right after the incident. And CM Punk left shortly after his match. 
So now we know they're suspended, allegedly. Mm-hmm. I just think this is a bad move going into All Out. We're about to preview All Out real quick because there's only five matches. But you're going into Punk's hometown where they boo the elite yeah. every time they've come through since Brawl Out. And now here we are at All Out. No CM Punk because of suspension. The, you know, we're hearing CM Punk rumors that CM Punk has also told people he hates being there now, that he's done with this, this effing company, allegedly. But now you're going to go to Chicago. Do you not know that that Chicago crowd is going to hijack your show with CM Punk chants? Especially when he's been advertised as being on the show, all the all the posters and the billboards and the buses and whatever, all the uh, advertising's got him on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, And it gets people, better, Pat. People are buying tickets expecting him to be there. Pat, it gets better. Dynamite's there, Collision's there, Rampage's there. All the shows uh-huh. are there in Chicago. Somebody remind me what the definition of insanity is. And I get I get that something <laughs> happened, but I don't think this was his fault in this case. No, I agree with you. I think Punk's in the right. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Like it, the fact that we heard about a prior incident where Punk was trying to talk to him, allegedly, like say, I'm not saying I was there because I wasn't. But the alleged story is this has been stemming over from a previous incident. It has not been handled, and obviously, on the day of your biggest show, it comes back up in a very public way. I think Perry, in my opinion, was wrong for you know taking that shot publicly. And then, yeah, you know, I can understand why Punk would want to confront him about that. It, you know, was it the right time and right place? In my opinion, no, but I understand it. Agreed. Well, let's talk about All Out because uh, we've only got five shows announced. I'm sure there's going to announce more, and it's going to be if you weren't if it wasn't Destination TV before. Just for the crowd alone, it might be now. Mm-hmm. Uh, first up, for the AWTNT Championship, your champion, Luchasaurus. That's right, Christian Cage is not the champion, it's Luchasaurus, for those that don't remember. Lu- Lu- Christian Cage will be in his corner. He's taking on Darby Allen for the AWTNT Championship. Can Darby Allen become a three-time AWTNT champion this Sunday? I'd hope so, but I don't think it's going to happen. No, probably Christian Cage uh, is going to Yeah, reasons. Interfere. Next up, Miro goes one-on-one with Powerhouse Hobbs in the match that none of us care about. I'm just going to throw that out there. Does anybody really care about this match? Uh, Miro's wife. Maybe. I don't even think she does. Yeah. She's probably still watching Bobby Lashley. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, whoa. You know, like, what do you, what, why, why is this? And, and I love how Tony and that, the, the thing that you talked about earlier, Pat, in his quote, oh, was yeah. trying to put this over like a great yeah. match. What great match? Powerhouse Hobbs, you haven't used properly. You mm-hmm. used him as a transitional champion. He deserves a lot more better than you've given him. And Miro, Miro is the same guy who we haven't seen in forever and cuts the the, the craziest, dumbest promo since the Ultimate Warrior. Mm-hmm. Let's just call it what it is. Nobody wants to see this match. Even the AEW diehards don't want to see this match. There's nothing behind this match. So I don't care. We all lose in this situation. Next. <laughs> Next up for the AW TBS Championship, your champion Chris Statlander goes against Ruby Soho. This should be a great match. This will be, yeah, this I should have been on all in, in my opinion. I agree. I agree. But instead, it's on all out. I'm happy to see it either way. I think Chris Stander, Statlander will still be the AW TBS champion when it's all said and done. This could be a match of the night. It could be. Next up for the AEW International Championship, it'll either be your champion currently, Orange Cassidy, or Penta El Zero Mato, since Orange Cassidy, for whatever reason, has to defend the AEW International title this upcoming Wednesday on Dynamite against Penta, and then the winner of that goes to face John Moxley. By the way, remind me again which team won. Thank you. Stadium Stampede. Why is John Moxley automatically get a bye to this spot? Why, Ken? Reasons. <sighs> well... I'm just going to put it this way. John Moxley will be and your new champion because Tony Khan doesn't know what else to, to do, even though with Orange is champion, that belt is flourished. Yeah, I he's what, 32-0? and 0? Yeah. Uh, and title defenses. Like, this is, your, this is your best title underneath your world title. And the fact that now Cassidy has to win to face the honor to fight John Moxley. Like, what what is going on he's here? He's got to defend his title twice in one week. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm sorry. I just, I don't get this at all. It's it's just, I don't know, silly booking. And last but not least for the announced matches, we got Kenny Omega, the cleaner, taking on Takeshita with Don Collis in his corner. This comes about actually for storyline reasons. They've been feuding for a while. And then, of course, Takeshita gets the uh, quick roll-up win in that uh, six-man tag at All In. Mm-hmm. It's nice to see this uh, get played out at All Out. Actually, this is one of the ones I'm looking forward to. This is going to be a great match. Yeah, this is going to be a solid match. Uh, Omega's winning, and then who knows, Osprey might come down and run in and set up something for their trilogy match. Well, we did just find out at the press conference that we're going to have the Dream, what was it, the Dream Wrestling or Dream Lover? Wrestle Dream. Wrestle Dream, that's what it was, matched. Uh, there's going to be a new pay-per-view in October, uh, New Japan and AEW. So, 
and celebrating Antonio Noki's birthday, mm-hmm. which is fine. I'm fine with yeah, it. Yeah, that's good. But if that's the case, maybe that's where we finally get Osprey Omega 3 for the now AWGP United Kingdom Championship. Mm-hmm. Well, that's going to do it for AEW Talk. We got, we got a lot into that AEW Talk, so we are going to take our first break. When we come back, we're going to hit you real quick with the Indie Roundup right after this break. And just like that, we are back for the mid card of this week's edition of 607 TWS. Of course, we got that little short bass drop from uh, Ken M over here. And it's now time to hit you with that Indie Roundup. And as you know, the Indie Roundup is brought to you by our good friends over at Fight.TV. More specifically, Fight Plus, where for $7.99 a month, you get a ton of great independent pro wrestling act- action. Not only do you get pro wrestling action, though, you also get soccer, rugby, you get bare knuckle boxing, you get regular boxing, you get MMA, and so much more. But because we're a pro wrestling podcast, we really truly only care about those great independent pro wrestling companies that are over there. Such companies like Game Changer Wrestling. Pro Wrestling Revolver, MLW, AIW, of course, also our good friends over at House of Glory, Glory Pro Live, and so much more, and more coming all the time over there to Fight Plus. Ken M, Fight Plus, is it not the greatest savings in all of pro wrestling? If you're a pro wrestling fan and you don't have it in your collection, I don't know what you're doing. Seriously, because you get the creme de la creme, if you will, of independent pro wrestling, let alone some of the best in combat sports. So it's such a win-win and such for a low cost. How can you go wrong? Absolutely. So thank you, Fight Plus, for sponsoring the Indie Roundup. Uh, Let's talk about this. Upcoming this weekend, we got two, count them, two Game Changer Wrestling shows coming to you from Hoffman Estates, Illinois. So Chicagoland area, if you will, Mm -hmm. at the Grand Sports Arena. And first up, on Friday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, only on Fight Plus, Game Changer Wrestling presents Say You Will 2023. Let's run through the card real quick, shall we, Ken M? Let's do it. Uh, First up, this match is going to be great. Talk about two GCW favorites. Gringo Loco goes one-on-one with 607 TWS's favorite asshole, Tony Deppin. Let's go. Can't that's, wait to see this one. That's going to be a great match. Trust me, Pat. That's a match that even you would want to check out. All right. Uh, next up, we have the return to a pro wrestling ring of Lash LaRue. That's right. WCW legend Lash LaRue what? will go one-on-one with the bad boy, Joey Janela. So what year is it? Uh, yes, we're back to 1999 real quick. Oh, absolutely. Uh, next up, we've got Speedball Mike Bailey going one-on-one with the Southern Psychopath, Mance Warner. Let's go. This is going to get a little extreme there, my friends. Next up, making their return again. Man, this is only a couple weeks ago they were in GCW. Maybe they're going to make a run for those Game Changer Wrestling Tag Team titles. Violence is forever. Dominic Greeny and Kevin Koo return to take on Bussy, Alley Catch, and Effie. Ooh. Next up, in a tag team match, Masha Slamovich will tag with the GCW Ultra Violent Champion, Rina Yamasha, to take on Los Maciso Ciclope and Miedo Extremo. Mm, can't wait to see that one. The GCW World Tag Team, or the sorry, the World Title will be on the line as your champion, All Heart Blake Christian, defends the title against Francisco Akira. Really? Yeah. Mm. That's going to be an interesting match up there. Oh, I can't wait to see that though. And in what I'm assuming is your main event of the evening, 
the man, the king, the god of this shit, Nick Effing Gage goes one-on-one -on -one with El Hijo Del Vikingo in Chicago, Illinois. That is talking, you want to talk about a clash of styles? Like, that is talking some big-time clashes right there. I can't wait to see this. I mean, how Nick has been putting on some great work lately. Yeah, fi, uh, so Friday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, check your local listings for your time. Uh, next up, though, GCW will be back on Saturday at 1 p.m., and then they will be back from Hoffman Estates once again at the Grand Sports Arena, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Start 12 p.m. Pacific, or sorry, not Pacific Central, where they're at. You know why? Because you can't have a weekend in Chicago. Without Effie's Big Gay Brunch. This is Effie's Big Gay Brunch number seven. Here's the matches we got so far. Lufisto goes one-on-one -on -one with Kid Bandit. Oh, let's go. It's nice to see her back in the ring after everything that's happened. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I can't wait to see her have a match with Kid Bandit. It's going to be a great match. Next up, eight eight-person tag team extravaganza as Joey Mayberry, Mateo Valentine, Moondog Murray, and Shelly Benson take on Angelo Carter, Queasy Asante, Logan Black, and Sazi Boatwright. Hmm. A lot of young talent. Yeah, there. I was going to say. Next up, Devin Monroe goes one-on-one -on -one with Rico Gonzalez. You know, they they always have great matches, both of them, on Effie's Big Gay Brunch. I think this is going to be another great match. Absolutely. Next up, Pero goes against Karam. Oh, That's like, going to be a battle of the beast. Yeah, to say the least. Next up, Pimpinella Escarada makes her return to Game Changer Wrestling. And she tags with somebody else making the return. Ken M, are you ready for it? You sitting down? I'm sitting. Pimparella Escarada teams with Sunny Kiss. What? To take on Bussy Alley Catch and Effie. Get out. Yes. So not only do we get the return of Pimpinella, one of the great Mexican luchadores, we get Sunny Kiss returning to the ring. Oh, I can't wait. Next up, and this match is going to be a good one, the High Priestess of the Church of Pro Wrestling, the Dark Sheik, goes one-on-one -on -one with Steph Delander. Ooh, that's going to be great. And in a match that is going to get violent, it's going to get hardcore, it's going to be a little bit ultra-violent, it might even be a death match, Ken. Billy Dixon goes one-on-one -on -one with Sawyer Wreck. Oh, let's go. It's going to be a great lineup. Effie's Big Gay Brunch. Just so you know, Pat, because I know you've never watched one, because you're not no. usually a big uh, Game Changer wrestling fan. Uh, it's a great it's a great feel. Everybody on the card is, you know, in the LGBTQ plus community. Okay. And it just showcases great talent. And the card is always great. It's always entertaining. And they bring in some really good wrestlers. I mean, they're bringing in the legendary Pimpinella. Yeah. And she's amazing. And Sunny Kiss making the return to Game yeah. Changer Wrestling. I cannot wait. Good for them. This is a big bucket of win for GCW and uh, Effie's Big Gay Brunch. But Saturday, there's another show on. Saturday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time from Clive, Iowa at the Horizon Event Center. And you know it could be only one promotion. Wrestling Revolver presents Redacted Forever. Ready for it? Let's do it. Listen, the first match on this list, take all my money if I had to pay for it, but I get it for Fight Plus for seven ninety nine. Speedball Mike Bailey goes one-on-one -on -one with Shun Skywalker. Oh, shit. <laughs> I'm going to start swearing there because that's how good this is going to be. Uh, next up, four-corner mayhem match. Zachary Wentz versus Alan Angels versus Crash Jackson versus Masha Slamovich. Ooh, that's going to be fun. In an extreme rules match, Damian Chambers bit off more than he can chew because he gets to take on the innovator of violence, Tommy Dreamer. Ooh. JT Dunn is going to go one-on-one -on -one with Ace Austin. Let's go. This is going to be a great match. That's going to be great. In a three-way match, Breeze takes on Matthew Palmer, takes on Dan the Dad. By the way, Pad, if you've never seen Dan the Dad, we need to get you familiar with Dan yes. the Dad. Yes, okay. Next up. Jessica takes on Marina Shafir. Okay. Uh, Marina might finally die. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm okay with that for one. Uh, next up for the Pro Wrestling Revolver tag team titles, and it will be a six-man tag team match. The second gear crew, One Call Manders, Mance Warner, and Matthew Justice take on the TNA Originals, Alex Shelley, Chris Sabins of the Motor City Machine Guns, and their tag team partner, Eric Young. Oh, <sighs> mind blown right here. And in the main event of the evening for the Revolver Championship. And this will be a no ropes barbed wire death match. Your champion, the fire starter, Jake Chris, goes one-on-one -on -one against what many consider the king of the death match. 
That would be Alex Cologne. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. No ropes, barbed wire, going down Saturday night for in Clive, Iowa, of all places. That's going to be insane. <laughs> But that's not it for the weekend. We got one more to talk about, and that's coming to you Sunday, Sunday, Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that is going to be from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at the 2300 Arena. And that will be Major League Wrestling Presents Fury Road 2023. Here's what they got announced so far. Of course, New Japan is a partner with this uh, event. First up, Kushida versus 607 TWS's favorite asshole, Tony Deppin. Oh, great way to start. Exactly. For the MLW National Openweight Championship, and this will be a weapons of mass destruction match, your champion, Jacob Fatu, goes one-on-one with RSP, Ricky Shane Page. Ooh. Next up, Hot Sauce Tracy Williams goes one-on-one with Ichiban. Okay. Kiss My Foot match as... Always ready, the alleged king of the death match, Matt Cardona, uh, takes on the southern psychopath, Matt Warner. Oh, God. <laughs> and after that, in a singles match, we have uh, a rematch from a Game Changer Wrestling Homecoming, by the way. Okay. As the cutest in the room, repping that MDK gang, Maki Ito, goes against Becca. Oh, that's going to be fun. And in the main event of the evening... For the MLW World's Heavyweight Champion, your champion, Alex Kane, defends the belt against Willie Mack. Ooh. It's going to be a great event there in Philadelphia this weekend. Lots of great stuff coming up on Fight Plus. $7.99 a month is all you got to pay, and you can see all that great action. Next week, we will break down all those shows and talk about what's coming up next on Fight Plus in the Indie Roundup as part of the mid-card. But that brings us to the close of this mid-card. We are going to take our final break. When we come back, we are going to preview WWE Payback 2023. Wrestling fans, are you ready? Uh, Let's get ready to rumble! That's right, it's time to rumble. It is time for the main event of this week's edition of 607 TWS. And of course, we got to talk about the big event going on this upcoming Saturday. September the 2nd, 2023, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, at the PPG Paints Arena. And, of course, that is WWE Presents Payback 2023. And uh, you know what? I'm going to say it out loud. This is the first card. And as long as we can remember that the bloodline does not have a match, Mm -hmm. nor does Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes. He has a segment. He has a segment. He does not have a match. Yes. I want to make that clear. We'll talk about his segment in a minute, but think about it. He's not wrestling. Nope. Neither is any member of the bloodline. For like probably the first time in three years, give or take? Give I, would, take. I would have to say so. Yeah. You know, Since Roman came back. It's it's interesting. It's very interesting. But let's start off with that then because it's not listed on the match because it's not a match. Uh, Cody Rhodes will be a guest on the uh, the Waller effect mm-hmm. with Grayson Waller. We've got, I'm, I'm assuming we're going to get uh, something going on. Probably. What do you guys think is going to go down between old uh, Cody Rhodes, the American Nightmare? In Grayson Waller. You know, I think this is first and foremost a big move for Grayson. For anybody that's wondering about where he's, you know, looking on the card, I think that he's going to be introducing Cody to his next feud. And, um, I, you know, I don't know where he's going to go. I'm, I'm assuming Judgment Day, but I, I can't say yes for sure. Okay. Uh, what are you thinking over there, Padawan Jay? I think it could lead to an impromptu thing. You know, 
uh, Grayson starts saying something insulting about the city of Pittsburgh, we know he's a big fan of the state of Alabama. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look at his social media from over the weekend, you know, he starts insulting the city of Pittsburgh and Cody goes, ah, listen, I'm not going to let you insult the city, fine city of Pittsburgh here. Why don't we settle this here in the ring? Quick match. Doesn't have to be anything crazy. One off. Get in, get out, get done. True. Um, I mean, and, and this is a this is a long stretch. I'm just mentioning it. This could be their way to backdoor Cody Rhodes onto SmackDown. Yeah. I think it's too soon for that. I, do, I really do. Yeah. I mean, it would work, though, because LA Knight's kind of backdooring his way onto Monday Night Raw. So you would actually just switch your two top baby faces. Yeah. And I'd be fine with it, but I think it's just too soon because then people are going to start waiting for Roman right. versus Cody. Right. That's the whole reason to have them on separate shows. So I don't think that that's going to be the case. Uh, my, my, my lock on this is that I'm with Ken. I think that it'll involve something with maybe J.D. McDonough will come out mm. on behalf of Finn Balor. Yeah. Since Finn Balor's busy, and that is going to lead to a little little feud for the next couple months, month or two, between uh, Finn Balor and, and Cody Rhodes, just kind of as a yeah. filler. Yeah. However, if Randy Orton's healthy, yeah. this could be where you bring Randy Orton back, and we get a nice little longer program, maybe three, four, you know, I would say three, four, even up to five-month program between Randy Orton and and uh, Cody Rhodes, because that would be a big one to build into the Mania season. Because mm-hmm. uh, obviously, where do you go after Brock Lesnar? And I think the story, if healthy, is Randy Orton. Yeah, Randy Orton can say he feels slighted, and if you really want this shot, you better uh, bring your A game against me. And I, I can totally see that happening. Yeah, so, I can yeah. totally see that. Yeah. So uh, if he's healthy, I would say that that's going to happen. But if not, I think I think Ken's right. I think it'll be something with Finn Balor. Although I think there will be a little beating up of Grayson Waller to to your point. So I think yeah. we all have a little parts to this. Mm-hmm. There's no way that Grayson Waller walks out of this ring unscathed, if you will. Next up, let's talk about the actual matches on the card. We'll start off with the actual undisputed WWE Tag Team Championship match in a Steel City street fight. Your tag team champions, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, will defend against the Judgment Day team of Finn Balor and senior Money in the Bank, Damian Priest. This has been building up quite well. Mm-hmm. I've been enjoying what I've been seeing. And, uh, you know, we're going to get a Steel <coughs> City Street Fight. I, got, I, I love the fact that we're naming them after the cities we're in again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the end of the day, though, I'm going to say the Judgment Day is going to come up short. And Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn will still be your tag team champions. And Mommy's not going to be real happy. Because she said if they don't bring gold back to the Judgment Day, anybody who doesn't have gold around their waist is going to be reassessed yes. after the pay-per-view. So I think that uh, there's more to that story that I'm going to talk about later. But uh, I'm thinking off the top, I think Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn walk out. A little bit of uh, still a little, uh, dis- you know, what do you call it? Uh, uh, dissension. Dissension in the ranks. Yeah. Of the Judgment Day. Uh, Padawan Jay, what do you got going on during this match? Uh, I think it's going to be uh, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. You know, they haven't had much time to defend the belts as of late through various uh, various reasons that aren't necessarily their fault. You know, hey, stuff happens. Um, but no, I, I think it's going to get close. I think we're going to get another JD McDonough show up, you know, try to help. You know, he's been successful the last couple of attempts on, on TV, but this is going to be the one time that, hey, you know, you know, nine times out of ten, you're right. Well, this is going to be the one time he's wrong, you know, and then failed to help them win. And then we're going to see the continued fallout with the Judgment Day because that's to me, has been the, the – like, I've, I've liked to get – I've liked the group before and I've liked what they've been doing, but it's it's the dissension. It's the cracking. It's the what's going to happen next. Who's going to get pissed off at who? Who might leave? Who might stay? That, to me, is what's most interesting. Agreed. Uh, Ken M, what you got? Fully think it's Kevin and Sammy still retaining, and I think it's just going to play into more dissension in the ranks. I like it. Next up, we got The Miz taking on L.A. Knight. Yeah. All right. Well, let's start right on with you, Padawan J. What do you got going on? And this like, this has been a nice little storyline with The Miz and L.A. Knight. I got to give Miz credit. He suckered the shit out of me on Monday Night Raw. Well, uh, you know, L.A. Knight's music hits, and I, and I was like, oh, all right, he's here again. And then very quickly realized... That is not L.A. Night. That is uh, Wish.com L.A. Night. Mm-hmm. That is, uh, Mom, can we have L.A. Night? No, we have L.A. Night at home. Uh, so kudos to Miz. Suckered the shit out of me. Uh, but no, I think this is going to be L.A. Night. Miz doesn't need this. Miz is listed off his accolades like 900 times in the build up to this. Miz doesn't need this. This is this is a moment to give L.A. Night the shine. Very true. Ken M., who do you got? This is L.A. Night all day. 
Yeah, I'm going to go with LA Knight as well. Although I will say this, the Miz is still proven that he gets it done on the mic and in the ring. So yes, he does. This should be a very good contest here. Next up, the United States WWE United States Championship will be on the line. Your champion, Rey Mysterio, defending against former champion, Austin Theory. This has been a little out of nowhere story because, of course, a little injury to Santos Escobar. Uh, Ken M., what do you got in this match? You know, I really don't know. I think this can go a lot of different ways. I, th- I think it's going to be Austin Theory, though. I am actually going to say, you know, I'd like to see Ray retain, but I think there's more opportunity when, with the face side of things and Austin Theory beating champion. So I'm going to go with, and new here as well. Padawan J. I can see him giving it to Austin Theory because then he could go, oh, I've beaten, you know, two of the biggest legends of, of this uh, millennium, you know, in, in WWE. You know, I beat Ray Mysterio and I beat John Cena. Hmm. I, I can see him doing that. But what I think is going to happen is, I just personally, because it was cool to see Austin Theory win, and I was intrigued to see what they were going to do for it, but they did absolutely nothing with him in, the, in this title run. So has anything changed that I think, oh, you know what? X, Y, and Z has happened. So I'd like to see a new, a new title run from him. For me, not really. So I think it's going to be uh, Rey Mysterio. I would like to read something to you. Okay. And these are all Friday dates. September 1st, Hershey, Pennsylvania. September 15th, Denver, Colorado. September 22nd, Glendale, Arizona. September 29th, Sacramento, California. October 6th, St. Louis, Missouri. October 13th, Tulsa, Oklahoma. October 29th, San Antonio, Texas, or sorry, 20th. And October 27th, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And then there's an Indian trip somewhere in there over to India. Yep. Do you know what those dates are? John Cena. I think you were onto something when you just named that off. I think, actually, now that you say it, I think he's going to beat Rey Mysterio. He's going to start bragging, and John Cena's music's going to hit. And whether it happens at Payback or at that super show in India, I think John Cena's going to become your and new United States champion for a little bit. Okay. Because, I mean, he's going to be around for two months. I mean, if there's any silver lining to the strikes going on in in Hollywood, yeah. it is that we're getting the return of John Cena yeah. for a couple months. Supposed to be two weeks and now it's about a month. Yeah, literally well, yeah, two two, two months, months of dates. Yeah. Literally the entirety of September and the entirety of October, every Friday, he is on yeah, because when Programming. they because when they initially announced it, it was this upcoming Friday at SmackDown, and then it was the the whatever show in India. Yes, and that was it. That was it. Yeah, and then just the other day, they're like, oh yeah, by the way, by the way, every every fr- SmackDown from now until October, yeah, we're getting John Cena. Yeah, and I mean, I'm okay with that. Yeah, perfectly I'm absolutely. Fine like with I said, that. I, I I hate what's going on out there with the SAG after yeah. WGA strikes. Yeah, but if the silver lining is that us wrestling fans get John Cena, so be it. Uh, next up, and I, I like your points. I think that might happen. Next up, women's world championship on your the line. The most dominant woman of all professional wrestling currently, because Camille finally lost the NWA yeah, Women's Championship. That was wild. You didn't see NWA seventy five. So now officially the most dominant woman in all of pro wrestling. Uh, Rhea Ripley will defend her title against Raquel Rodriguez. I like this matchup, gentlemen. Yeah, I like it a lot because it looks good on paper. It looks good when you with the eye test. I mean, Raquel's very big. So is Andrea. This is the battle of, of two bulls. And this could be a coming out party for Raquel Rodriguez. Mm-hmm. I, With that being said, I think Rhea Ripley still wins this match. But I think this is going to be somebody who challenges her. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, like I said, <coughs> this could be, even in a loss, this could be a huge up. Grade four, Raquel Rodriguez. Your thoughts, Padawan J? Yeah, no, I think this is going to be a great matchup. I think it's going to be Rhea Ripley at the end of the day, but I think Raquel's going to be a good, real test for Rhea because Rhea's been dominant. She's been beating everybody in real quick times. But Raquel, you look at how they were showing it on Monday Night Raw where it wasn't just Rhea beating the you-know-what out of her. It was Raquel. No, she's getting some shots and she's getting some fight back. You know, she's putting up a fight. I, it's going to be a great match in Raquel. I could see this going for a couple of pay-per-views, a couple of matches. You know, I don't think it's going to be a one and done, but it's going to be a test for Rhea. Absolutely. Ken M. Great matchup for Rhea. I still think Rhea wins, but at least it's because Raquel, you know, back in the main event scene, obviously she's been doing a lot of work in the tag team division for a while. So right. I think this would be a great match to kind of build for something. But I think all roads point to Rhea and Shayna Baszler. Next up, steel cage matchup. Becky Lynch, the man, you know, big, big time Bex taking on the legend, the Hall of Famer, Trish Stratus. This is inside of a steel cage to presumably uh, stop anybody from interfering. We've built to this level. I want to say up front, I'm just going to say up front before we get our picks. 
for anybody who was kind of weirded out and questioned them not being on SummerSlam, the crowd reception for this feud has been lackluster at best. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know if WWE actually dropped the ball. I think they gave them the time. I think they did what they needed to do. But I just don't think the crowd really cares. And it's nothing against Becky. And it's nothing against Trish Stratus. And I know that Bully Ray famously said on Busted Open that maybe maybe Becky should step away for a while. Yeah. You know, take a vacation, leave, because, uh, you know, uh, distance makes the heart grow fonder. I know that's probably not going to happen too soon because, obviously, this past uh, Monday, as we recorded yesterday, the NXT Women's Champion, Tiffany Stratton, showed up on Monday Night Raw mm-hmm. sitting ringside. For two women's matches. For two women's matches. Kind of putting her smarks. I mean, obviously, she's going to be coming up to that main roster soon, I would assume. Yeah. She's a great talent. Yeah. I mean, she still has some things to work on, according to herself. And I love her mentality on things. If you never heard her interview with Busted Open Radio, find it, seek it out. Because it's actually, she's got her head on her shoulders, and she's she's learning every day. I think Tiffany Stratton is going to be one of the best in the future uh, to come. We haven't even seen her final form yet. Yeah. Uh, not even scratch the surface. She's that young in the business, and she's already good. Uh, so when you look at it like this, you know, we probably are going to get that Becky Tiffany Stratton match probably in NXT and to bully's point, he didn't say she had to go home, mm-hmm. but it might not be a bad deal for Becky. Maybe to go down to NXT, take the title off of Tiffany Stratton. So she finally gets her NXT title run, adds that to her list of accomplishments. Cause she never got it. Yeah. Right. And then she can work with some of the younger talent. She can help get NXT over. Because listen, the one thing they've been doing good down there is it's not a demotion to go down there. Baron Corbin went down there and reinvented himself. Mm -hmm. Apollo Crews went down there and reinvented himself. You know, Becky Lynch can go down there and get herself a break off of main roster television while teaching the young kids something. And I know she has a passion for that. I think that that's what I would do. I would have her go down at the next pay-per-view for NXT and take on Tiffany Stratton. And uh, win the world and win the NXT Women's Championship. With that being said, we got to talk about Becky and Trish. Pad, what do you think about that match? Well, so to your point about Becky going to NXT, there is a possibility of this because a couple weeks ago, whatever it was, it was brought up mistakenly saying she was an NXT Women's Champion. And so I think Tiffany Stratton mistakenly. Yes, it was mis- Tiffany Stratton. She mistakenly mm-hmm. listened her and Sony called her out on it. She's like, oh, and Stratton responded. But Becky Lynch came back and said, well, I'm not NXT champ- Women's Champion yet. So right. there is a possibility of that, and to your point, uh, the next NXT uh, show or pay-per-view is No Mercy on September the 30th, so could be. It's not too far if we can build that. I mean, yeah. obviously, Tiffany Stratton was on TV. Tiffany Stratton could be uh, on the yeah. pay-per-view coming up this Sunday, or Saturday as well. But for the matchup between Becky and Trish at, at Payback, listen, this is no disrespect to Becky or Trish. I have the utmost respect for the both of them. Trish Stratus, one of the best of all time, you know, Becky Lynch in that conversation of one of the best of this current generation. I don't care for this for I'm, I'm one of those fans that like, I was really intrigued to see this. And I'm like, Oh, two of the best of all time, you know, best of that, her generation, one of the best of the current generation writes itself. I'll be honest. They had their, they had their match last night with, with Zoe Stark taking on, Becky in a, in a false count anywhere match. And obviously Trish got involved. I started playing a game on my phone. I, I just didn't care. You know, another week I was falling asleep during the little promo off they had between Becky and Trish. I don't know what it is, but like, I figured this is easy money for me. I should be sinking my teeth into this and being like, yes, I'm, I'm excited to see this. This is one of my highlights of the show. I, I just don't care. You know, so who I think is going to win. Probably Trish because Zoe Stark's going to get involved. Uh, Ken, who you got? You know, I think this is going to be Becky. I just think that Trish, I think the program has served its course. I think Trish can go away and then come back if they want to do something like Survivor Series, kind of give some time off. I just think that the crowd's sinking into it as much as WWE had thought. Well, I'm going to go with my two thoughts on this. I, I honestly think it's going to be Becky. Uh, much to Padawan Jay's uh, point, you know, last time we saw Trish take on somebody from this generation was Charlotte Flair. Right. Put over Charlotte Flair. I think Trish is just on that, you know, let's put over this new generation kind right. of thing. And, and go off in the shadow at the same time well, you know, getting herself over. And it's great. And it's nice to see her back in the ring, let's be honest. Yeah. The other yes. thing that she's doing very well, that Trish is doing very well, is that real life she's traveling with Zoe Stark. WWE is really 
grooming Zoe Stark to be the next big thing in the women's division, and I think she has all the tools. And last night kind of proved it. She had a decent yeah. match with Becky Lynch. She got some good responses. People weren't responding to her before. And I think that at the end of the match, and mostly because of Becky holding up the Bray Wyatt, or the Wyndham, sorry, yeah. uh, armband, yeah. I think that they brought some emotion and cheers to the end of that match. But at the same time, the match was very serviceable and good in the main event of Monday Night Raw. So therefore, I think we built on some good stuff with Zoe Stark. Uh, and I think you're going to see more from her coming up in the future too. So I think out of this few that maybe we all don't care about, I think we've set the table for a possible Becky Lynch go back to NXT feud with Trifini Stratton, possibly come champion, takes a few months off of the main roster while still being in the ring and working with the young folks and still getting to do her family stuff and then comes back to a brand, you know, brand new, you know, you know, being away makes the heart grow fonder. And then, of course, Tiffany Strand's probably on her way to the main roster sooner than later. Yeah. And Zoe Stark's on her way up the card. And we'll see what's next for Trish Stratus if Trish Stratus doesn't just go home for a little while until the next big event. Who knows? Mm. All right. It's time to talk about it. Uh, this is the last one that's announced. And then we're going to kind of get ideas if there's any other matches you guys think will be announced. Uh, of course, this one is for the uh, WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Your champion, Seth freaking Rollins, going one-on-one with Shinsuke Nakamura. This one has been getting a lot of good traction, a lot mm-hmm. of good build. Of course, originally it's Nakamura said, hey, I want to be focused back on a championship. He took his shot at uh, you know, Seth Rollins after that wonderful uh, uh, six man tag team match yep. took a shot at him. Then he challenged him. And then, in the process of challenging him, he also reminded him he knew that his back was screwed up. Mm-hmm. And now he has cut two of the best promos mm-hmm. I have seen in a long time. Yep. Not just from Shinsuke, but from anybody. I love these promos. They're on edge. I love how they're letting him cut them in Japanese. I think it, it comes across, and I mean, uh, for me and Ken, we see this a lot. It comes across like New Japan promos. Yes. Where they put the subtitles underneath. And I really, really dug it, and I've liked what he's been saying. Like, hey, I know your back is weak. I'm going to take advantage of that. You know, but I, you know, at the same time, I'm going to be the reason you can't pick up your child. I'm going to be the reason why you're confined to your bed. I'm going to cripple you. It's it's like very, very malicious. Mm-hmm. It's this another size Shinsuke, and I love what we're seeing. Love, love, love what we're seeing. Now, with that being said, I'll give mine first because I, I have – I mentioned something earlier. Mm-hmm. I think – the, the Seth Rollins will retain the WWE World Heavyweight t- t- uh, title. I think it's going to – he's going to have an injured back. I think it's going to be bad, but he's going to squeak it out. Mm-hmm. And I think that Senior Money in the Bank Damian Priest will seize the moment. And when this when it's all said and done and payback, we will have a new WWE World Heavyweight Champion. And that man will be named Damian Priest. Mm. Reason behind this is, A, he, he deserves it. B, they've been building him up very well in recent memory. I mean, his only loss, I think, in the last three months, not counting tag matches, was uh, to Cody Rhodes. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and other than that, he has beat some of the top names in WWE, including Sami Zayn. And I'm looking at it like this. I think that they've been grooming him for a while. Me and Ken have been saying it forever Mm -hmm. on the show, and I know you've agreed with it too, Pat, that he was going to be a champion sooner than later. Yeah. And I think there's time, and I think why, because it fits in storyline, because I think that you really pull on the fact that, you know, they've been really, Seth has said how bad his back is. I don't know if it truly is that bad. I'm, I I don't know him. Hasn't been reported. Never was reported. However, I did know that he has been nursing some injuries. Sure. So this is a good time to go, oh, 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 I got hurt real bad, and Damian Priest took advantage <laughs> of I'm a fighting champion. I went out on my back. You know, obviously, we just talked about how Becky Lynch might be going down to NXT or whatever. So give both of them some time off. You know, give him a few months off. We get the whole story of him rehabbing. And when you least expect it, he, he returns to the ring. And then we have Damian Priest as champion, which adds another layer into the blood. Uh, the, sorry, I almost said bloodline because it's that good. Judgment Day story. Because remember, if you don't have gold, we're reassessing your spot. So who's the only person who won't have gold? Uh, at that point, it'd be Finn. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So now maybe J.D. McDonough and Finn Balor are lining themselves up to take on the the rest of the Judgment Day. Uh, who knows? We, there's a lot of things you could do with that. Mm-hmm. A lot of things. And at this point in Junction, the Judgment Day is pretty much his faces except for Dominic Mysterio. Right. So, you know, you know, Dom Dom is going to be Dom Dom. Yeah. So I'd like to get you guys' thoughts on this as well. So we'll start with Padawan Jay. What are your thoughts on the main event? Well, possible main event. What I assume is the main event of the evening. I've loved the build up to this. You know, I, I watch every Monday night with my girlfriend. And, you know, she doesn't usually pay firmly attention, but she's listening in the background. And when Shinsuke brought up the, oh, I know your back is hurt, she looked at me and went, wait, is that true? And I looked at her and I went, you know, I don't know. You know, I was like, it hasn't been reported anywhere, but it wouldn't surprise me if there's an inkling of truth to that. 
you know, but the two promos he's cut in all Japanese have been incredible. You know, this has been a feud that like you don't need a long buildup for. It's it's already made, ready to go. I think ultimately, I agree with you. I think that uh, Seth is going to get the win, but I think Damien is going to try to come and cash in and try. I don't think he's going to get it off, and you're going to try and get Finn and, and JD McDonough down there to help because JD, you know, I'm, I'm buddies with Finn. I'm trying to help you out, and ultimately, that's going to cost. Damien from getting it further to, uh, dissension between the uh, judgment day question. Do you think that it's going to cost him the money in the bank as well? Or do you think it's just going to cost him that, that timing of it timing? Cause I mean, I, I don't think, I don't, I don't think he's going to get the timing off and I think it's going to lead to a split and leave it down to mommy Rhea Ripley figuring out. All right. I said, you know, if you don't have gold in this, we're going to reassess your placement. All of a sudden Dom's got gold, quote unquote. He's got the NXT North American title. Rhea's got her championship. Now you've got two other members who don't have gold. She's gonna have to pick a side. I like she it. she's been because she's been playing peacemaker mm-hmm. and she's been playing therapist. And hey, you know, listen, we got to sort this out. You guys got to get on the same page, you know. And now ultimately, hey, push comes to shove. Whose side are you picking? Agreed. I like that. Ken, what's your thoughts? It's going to be a great match. I am going to say a new, but I'm going with your theory, Rich. I think Damian Priest is walking out with the world title at the end of the day. I think that Nakamura is going to go for some post-match shenanigans, and Damian's going to swoop in there, get the gold. Finn's going to try stopping him. The dissension happens, and we're going to have a split between the uh, Judgment Day. Good point. I, I, like I won't be mad if, if uh, Damian wins the belt. He's a guy for me that when he first debuted on NXT, I did not care for him in the slightest. Once he won the North American title, though, and and had that run, that's where I'm like, oh, okay, I'm starting to get this. He's great, and he can work both. He can both work both face and heel. We've seen him do both, and he does both very well. That's always an important thing. Now, that was only six matches on the card. Seven segments, if you count uh, Cody Rhodes on the Grayson effect. Uh, Grayson Waller effect, mm-hmm. sorry. Uh, so, what do you think they'll add another match? Historically, they've been lately doing eight matches. If they do, what do you think it will? A lot of people thought they'd add the Intercontinental Championship match. However, that is added to Raw next week, so we know that will not be happening at Payback. Mm. I mean, they could always change it up, but they did yeah. announce it for Raw. And I just think they'll keep it on Raw because they, you know, they've been doing really good with stuff like that. What do you think that they may add to Payback, if anything? They might not. Maybe just seven segments. I think we get a Jimmy Uso sighting. Okay. Like, we know he's supposed to appear on Friday. Right. I think he'll do something like he's going to call out Jay on Sunday. Okay. Or se- so on a little day. segment, maybe? A little maybe? segment. Okay. No- right. Nothing super crazy, but you'll have something like that. All right, Pat, anything you think might happen? I think we won't see the IC title uh, on the belt, on the defendant, but I think we could still see Alpha Academy take on Imperium. Yeah, maybe a tag team because there was that whole thing on Monday night with them and the other faction, the other members got involved in whole kerfuffle. I could, I could see them doing. Hey, you know what? Because of that, why don't we do this? You know, I, I could all. You know, we got. There, it looks like a pretty balanced card. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I'm. You know, it, it's one of those cards. I'm going to say this. It doesn't look sexy on paper. It really doesn't. Solid though. But it looks solid. And it, here's what's been happening lately, and I think we can all attest this. WWE lately, when the when the pay per views don't look all you know loaded. Yeah. They deliver. Yeah, they mm-hmm. do. They've yeah. delivered. I mean, look how many, like, I honestly, Backlash wasn't really loaded. Right, right. I mean, I guess if you count the main event. Yeah. But f- for the most part, it wasn't loaded. But Past it, the main it event. It ended up being really yeah. good. Past the main event, you're like, yeah, okay. You know what I mean? There's been a lot of shows where they, I think they've really stepped up. So I think, I, I'm assuming this one will be the same. I don't know if they had to add an eighth. If I'm adding an eighth match, though, I might actually try to uh, include the, the what for lack of a better term, the new Hurt business, mm. some way, shape, or form. Okay, I think that might be a good idea, or or maybe a Riddle and Drew McIntyre against somebody business, yeah. and maybe have the turn happen because eventually got to turn Drew McIntyre heel. I'm assuming that's what they're going to do. Yeah, eventually. Yeah. So maybe maybe something like that. I I, I could see that I, happen. I, I, not this weekend though, because he's supposed to have them. They're supposed to have the matchup with Viking Raiders next week. So maybe maybe not this weekend. I'm just saying I, yeah. I could see. A, I would. I'm. I kind of would like to see the new Hurt business for lack. So they haven't named them yet. Right. So I, I would like to see that maybe, uh, maybe them had the card. Yeah. It could have happened. Like, I mean, I think they should because obviously that's starting to take up some steam. I just don't know if they're going to be doing it or not. That's the only thing. I agree. I'm just saying they don't necessarily need to add anything. Actually, right. I'm good with the seven segments. Yeah. Seven solid segments, yeah. you know, especially with a couple surprises in there. Because, uh, you know, even if it's only one, I mean, there's a possibility of John Cena showing up. It's sure. a real possibility. I mean, sure. he's going to be on 
SmackDown Friday, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and he's booked for the next eight SmackDowns. Yeah, <laughs> plus you know the the India show. Yeah, so there's a real possibility he shows up at Payback. Yeah, you know, and then of course you know if they ca- if the cash in on Money in the Bank happens, that's a big one that we talked about. Now, mind you, neither of them could happen. They both could happen. Right. One of them could happen. But I mean, there's a lot. There's enough. I don't think the people when they're breaking this card down because I've heard some people going, "Oh, it doesn't look that great." And I've seen people that I said just what I said lately. Even the ones that don't look so great on paper end up taking off pretty well. I mm-hmm. oh, agreed. So that is going to bring us to the end of this week's 607 TWS. Of course, next week we will be reviewing both AEW's All Out and WWE's Payback plus the Indie Roundup and so much more. Also, as a reminder, it has now been like two months and three weeks. So we're almost at three months. Almost at three months. Since we've offered Tony Khan or any management member of AEW to come on 607 TWS and ask a few, answer a few questions. Once again, we'll provide them up front. We, we're not trying to be assholes here. We're just trying to get some answers to some questions we have. And, uh, you know, hey, once again, I get it. Somebody's like, oh, but that just benefits you. No, it doesn't just benefit me. I think it benefits wrestling fans as a whole because uh, I think we got questions that nobody else is asking because they're too worried that they're going to get cut off. Mm-hmm. So I would just like to ask her, have some questions answered. So once again, you know the email addresses, send them. And uh, with that, Ken M, tell the fine folks one more time how to find yourself in the Otodoro Parlay Hour Podcast. I'm going to defer this one to the one and the lead, Padawan J. ODPHpodcast.com. And of course, if you're trying to get a hold of me in the 3FN Podcast, hit us up, 3FNpodcast.com. Well... Thank you once again. Thank you for our special guest for the show. I mean, if you're listening on the ODPH network, you know this man very well. But if you're listening on 607 TWS and for whatever reason aren't listening to the ODPH, you better start because next week, if you're a football fan, yep. it gets real. Yep. Tuesday and Wednesday. Get ready, folks. And, uh, of course, so thank you, Padawan J, for being on 607 TWS on this crossover uh, extravaganza. And, of course, for myself and Ken M, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and most importantly, the later wrestling fans! If you take my... Top ropes, one, two.